LX Security, The Roosevelt Mission, A Pockets Universe Story. Chapter 1, LX Ballas Branch Headquarters, Tukra, Orbiting Ballas Prime, Ballas System, Ballas Branch. This is the Roosevelt Clan, the seasoned commander's voice boomed from the front of the austere chamber, where their squad of 50 LX security agents sat in rows of folding chairs. A hologram blinked into existence on the table at the front of the room. Thirty-five, maybe forty faces, the upper echelon of the organized crime syndicate. The command hub wasn't overly impressive, brimming with the weight of countless space cycles and clandestine operations. The room was hewn from raw moon rock, its walls striated with geological history and speckled with embedded minerals that caught the dim blue light from the bioluminescent orbs affixed to the ceiling. Cables and pipes, pulsating with energy and life-supporting fluids, snaked across the high ceiling. At the room's heart, a long carbon fiber table stretched out, strewn with data pads, remnants of nutrient-rich rations, and a plethora of advanced tech devices. The agents were seated in rows of sleek, metallic chairs, their quiet whispers and movements reverberating subtly off the solid rock walls. A portal-shaped window on the far end of the room offered a haunting view of the barren lunar moon Tukra, which orbited Ballas Prime, where the home station of Elex Security of Ballas Branch was located. The moon's rugged terrain bathed in the cold, distant light of the host planet. The air held a metallic tang, punctuated by the sterile scent of recycled air and an undercurrent of latent excitement from the assembled agents. This is their leadership, but their total membership is 5,000 strong. The sons of bitches have the Tevsu system in a headlock and are making incursions into a knot, the man said, pointing at the line that connected the two systems, signifying that there were ring gates between them. Baird Known, a recent enlist and part of 25th Squad with Aitan, raised his hand. The old man nodded. And why do we care? Aton was a massive man, nearly seven feet tall, with long, unkempt hair that flows down to his shoulders. He towered over everyone else in the room, even sitting down. Great question, the man said, pointing at Baird. Why do we care? Why don't we leave Tevsu to its own devices? Can we work with whoever comes out on top? No, we care because Elix has invested a lot of money into bringing Tevsu into the modern age. We've given them tech and weapons. We've helped them harness trade opportunities. We've helped our hand-picked ruling government hold on to power. We modernize their navy and police forces. We give them everything, and still, the dumb fucks can't keep the backwoods crime family from becoming more powerful than them. The room chuckled. They have the Tevsu government by the balls. It's our job to loosen that grip and eventually squash them, or stop them from squashing them, rather, the old man said as he paced back and forth in front of them. A few minutes ago, I delivered the details of their entire operation to your comm units. Get to know those details intimately as quickly as you can. Details are important for a thing like this. He sat down at the table in front of the hologram. But here's the basics. This, he said as he pointed at a middle-aged man with brown skin and the headshot at the top of the org chart, is Mal Gaula. He is the leader of the Roosevelt clan. What's so special about them, you might ask? Well, he started the organization as almost exclusively a protection racket and loan sharking operation about two decades ago. They flew mostly under the radar. It was only in the last few years that they've expanded and fast. Drugs, women, human trafficking, smuggling, piracy, you name it, and they have their toes in the water. So how do they get to become top dogs so quick when just a few years ago they were a minor player? Well, we don't know. Something changed. A new supplier, an investor, some influx of cash we don't know about? We don't know. But we do know that they grew extraordinarily fast, had two or three quick wars where they trampled the other crime orgs in Tevsu and immediately put the screws to the government. We estimate that they've dropped at least 50 bodies in the last year. While they haven't said this to me, I suspect that our overlords at LX Corp just plain old don't want to deal with these guys. This will be our platoon's only assignment for the foreseeable future, barring any emergency needs for the VOR. Or if war breaks out in the core, we will probably be called back to protect assets. So until the end of the world, I guess. Pfft! Millie, another member of the 25th Squad with Aitan, scoffed. They've been talking about war for years. It's never going to happen. 
Indeed, the war that never comes, personally. I'm tired of talking about it. Anyway, each of the five squads has an assigned goal, he said, then ran through the goals, which were two, he said, as he motioned toward bullet points that appeared on the wall in front of him. One. Infiltrate their organization as an undercover drug supplier on Saneon. 2. Invest eye-gating and breaking up their human trafficking operations on Tevsu Station. 3. Investigating and dismantling their political ties on Saneon. 4. Identifying political operatives and bribed politicians throughout the Tevsu system. 5 attacking their low- and middle-level operations to cripple them and provoke entanglements with other adversaries on Sanion. Naturally, being a behemoth, they wanted Atan to bust some heads. The last of the dove on the list has been assigned to his squad, the 25th. Look, I understand we each have our separate tasks here, but we're all working toward the same goal, completely dismantling their organization. We have been tasked with taking them off of the board through any means necessary. These assignments are subject to change over time. If you can make a dent, we will get you into the next thing. As always, with every mission that we undertake, our primary concern here is discretion. This isn't something we want to or even can get done in a year, more like two or three. This is a slow burn, and our goal is to erode them over time. Leave no trace and consider every detail. Always send them down the wrong trail. Be smart, that's it. We don't want to draw any attention here. Any questions? The squad made eye contact, each with raised eyebrows and an ear-to-ear -ear smile. Now, this was an assignment. Chapter 2 LX Ballas Branch Headquarters Tukra Moon Orbiting Ballas Prime Ballas System Ballas Branch the Elix Corp. Ballas Branch Headquarters, a monolithic structure of steel and glass, stood starkly against the desolate beauty of Tukra, the largest moon of Ballas Prime. This colossal edifice, a testament to human engineering, was the nerve center of operations for the Elix Corporation in the Ballas system. The station was a fascinating fusion of sharp angles and smooth curves, its metallic skin gleaming under the pale, otherworldly light of the distant sun. Tukra was a vast, barren expanse of rugged, rocky terrain, punctuated by a patchwork of craters and ravines. Its low gravity, a mere quarter of Earth's, made magnetic boots a necessity for those traversing the station. The moon, in its silent and solemn splendor, was a constant reminder of the isolation and vastness of space. Inside the station, the small meeting room that had been assigned to them was a hub of activity, bustling with the team's preparations. The four original members, squad leader Caro Forn and second officer in command Milly Calaba, officer Baird Noon, and officer Aitan Finley, along with their newest addition, Agent Felson, a hacker of considerable repute, were huddled in intense discussion. The room hummed with the low buzz of state of the art holographic displays and electronic devices, punctuated by the soft clanks of their mag boots against the metallic floor. Alex Corp. Owning Tukra entirely used the station as a staging ground for its grandest ventures in the Ballas branch systems. It was one of the company's strategic security locations, with Elix security teams deployed across all of the 68 colonized systems mankind had managed to colonize. The station was a beacon of human resilience and ambition, a lighthouse shining in the vast, uncharted ocean of the cosmos and it was the last stop before the more desolate locales the farther you go down the branch. They've got us going to Sanion, Caro Forn, the barrel-chested squad leader said as he thumbed through the hologram documents in front of him, occasionally flicking his wrist and sending it to the big wall in front of them to show them what he was looking at. Looks like they are running a lot out of the spaceport there. Prostitution, drugs, weapons, data. I think it's best to assume that these guys own the police there. They are doing a lot wide out in the open. There's a handful of buildings they are running out of, a handful of more they own that we have no intel on. Hell, yes, Millie Calaba said. They are letting us kick down the whole operation? Yes, well, the whole operation on Sanion anyway. Look here, he said as he flipped a map up on the screen. On the right side of the screen was a big, large, gray square that was labeled Spaceport. To its east was the decently large city of Soli. 
a domed city that was basically the only colonized location on the planet. Different buildings were labeled as the Roosevelt clans or suspected associated properties. There were at least three dozen littered throughout the city. Jesus, Aton growled. They really are all over this planet. They are, but let's simplify. Five properties for five field agents, Caro said, and the 36 properties shrunk down to five properties. Well, six, he said as he glanced over at Felsen, who was hunched over his computer, and five field agents. These are the five most important centers of commerce for the Roosevelts. All other properties are likely connected to these in some way, as these serve as the central hub based on pinged locations of coma devices and tracked packages. Here, he said as the largest boxy building, the one closest to the spaceport, was highlighted yellow on the hologram, is where their warehouse is located. It's closest to the port and a larger building. This is the first point of entry for everything. Drugs, girls, data, weapons, components, all of it. Our satellites have picked up a steady flow of transport vehicles coming to and from the property. Aton raised his hand. He nodded in his direction. So that's our big target? Correct, Caro said. This is the big boy. We take this facility with the goods inside of it, and we are back on the transport ship headed home to Balas. So why wouldn't we just take that? We can see when big shipments are likely coming from the port, Aton asked. Why go through the trouble of hitting their other operations when we could just cut the head off of the snake? Well, see, there's a few problems with that, Aton, that I'm sure you would have realized if you had put even a little bit of thought into it. First, that blows our cover, not just on what we are doing here, on the whole operation. Remember, there are other moving parts here. We were instructed to take our time, not run in guns blazing. If we do too much too early, we will spook them. They'll tighten up and we won't be able to get anywhere. These guys might be stupid enough to bottleneck all of this illegal activity through the same warehouse, but they have more than enough to survive it. Fair enough, Aton said with a head nod. As a younger man, he might have felt it was a little bit silly, but he knew the answer before he had asked it, and Caro had known that he would ask it. It was important that people understood the pace of a mission. With so many moving parts and none of those parts able to telegraph their every move together, it made sense to take things slow. So, we won't start there. We'll take a step down from there. We have four main locations. There is this small building in the north side of the dome, he said, and that building lit up on the hologram that was displayed on the wall. This, we believe, is the main drug stash house. Once it leaves the main warehouse, the drugs head here. There's just not enough storage space for components or illegal goods or anything here. Plenty of room for bags of coda, though, Caro said. Coda was the name for a popular time-release drug that was relatively cheap to produce and lasted a full day. Its effects were said to change throughout the day. First, it gave the feeling of a strong stimulant. About four or five hours after ingesting it, the relaxed euphoria stage would kick in and have users drooling and nodding off. Finally, they'd come out of their slumber and have a light buzz as they settled in. All in all, it wasn't the most destructive drug, but both the core governments and Ellix saw it as the biggest threat, given how widespread its use had become. Then we have the El Corona, the mega strip club that they run their prostitution rings out of. The girls are shuttled to brothel houses all around the city, one in each neighborhood, practically. The bombshells stay in the club. The sevens and below working girls are sent out into the fray. Early intelligence indicates that they do not treat these women well, even by backwater planet prostitution ring standards. Millie sucked air through her teeth. Sick fucks, she said. Then we have this building. It looks to be some kind of repurposed barracks or another military facility. Maybe one that was never used, or one the Roosevelts managed to have shut down. We don't have any intel on what goes on here, just based on the fact that this building looks sizable and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of traffic on the satellites, my assumption is that this may be a weapons storage facility. We'll see about that. And last but not least, we have this property. It was one of the taller buildings in the downtown area. Since everything had to fit under a dome, no building went much more than 20 stories. In fact, on this planet and most other colonized worlds, most of the construction tended to move underground. What appeared to be five stories of the building lit up. This is the headquarters for their corporate operations. All of the companies that are registered to them, 
and there are dozens of them, operate out of this building here. We have no idea what's inside, no clue how many, if anyone, is there on a day-to-day -day basis, but they have to pay a substantial amount to buy a piece of property like this. So where are you thinking we should start? Aton asked. Getting there, Caro said as he raised his eyebrows and pointed toward Aton. Millie giggled in the back. So, obviously, before we decide which building to start with, we have to nail down what we are doing first. There is a lot going on here, a lot of moving parts. So I say we take a few weeks and get a lay of the land, run some surveillance on some of these five properties along with others. We can get some drones in the air and track some of the players. Let's learn how they operate and what they do. And when the opportunity presents itself, we will know it when we see it. Aton nodded in agreement. He couldn't argue with the logic. Of course, he knew that there was more coming. Caro was pragmatic. He always wanted to get a feel for things before doing anything as long as they could afford it. But he also always had a suggested route. There is one wrinkle, Caro said, almost as if Aton had cued him with his mind. Roosevelt clan owns the system, we all know that. They have the city here, the port, the moon-based spaceport, and presence in all of the major stations throughout the system. They don't have a true competitor. Except for here in the city. Here there is another gang known as the Skells. Short for skeletons, apparently. They predate the Roosevelt guys. They've been here in some form or another since the planet was first colonized, and they are nasty. In fact, the Roosevelt clan is at war with the Skells. Jesus Caro, excuse me, squad leader Fuang, you don't think you could have led with that? Seems pretty pertinent, Aton said. Well, hold on. It's more of a cold war, in actuality. The violence comes in waves. The last time bodies started dropping was three years ago, and over 30 bodies dropped in the city alone. They reached some sort of agreement, and things have cooled since then. But they've been killing each other on and off since the Roosevelts arrived 25 years ago. My point here, though, is that there is a tension here we can exploit. When these groups go to war, they really get after it. Maybe we could strike the match. They sat in silence for a moment. Now that, Millie said as she jumped up from her seat. Sounds like a hell of a plan, squad leader. Let's see if we can't get those bastards to do our work for us. Chapter 3 Aboard the Barak Headed for the Tevsu System Vanna System Balas Branch their vessel, the Barak was masquerading as a common private hauler, was an unassuming titan of steel and high-end fusion propulsion designed for long-haul interstellar trips. The ship was a utilitarian masterpiece, its exterior adorned with the scuffs and dents of hard work, effectively concealing its true purpose. It bore the markings of a small private company contracted by Elix Corp, a cover story that deflected prying eyes and unwelcome questions. The massive corporation's name was a shield, warding off any potential trouble. But they had to conceal their travels as best they could. Inside, the ship was a labyrinth of corridors and compartments, each filled with the hustle and bustle of a working cargo vessel. Hidden behind this facade, specialized compartments housed Elex security gear and augment suits, ready to be deployed at a moment's notice. The journey from Balas to Tevsu was a marathon, not a sprint. The eight-week trip through the vast expanse of space was spent in the ship's communal areas where the team could study, prepare, and get to know each other. They had to navigate through six ring gates interspersed with potential wait times and other stops, which necessitated careful planning and a flexible schedule. When traveling to the depths of a system, the ship's liquid burn beds provided respite from the punishing G-forces of a hard burn. These were essentially pods filled with a specialized gel that cushioned the body, mitigating the effects of high-speed space travel. However, Aton found that entering and exiting these beds outweighed their benefits due to Aton's size. He'd rather lay in his normal bed and weather it as best as he could. As soon as the team was on board, the hauler roared to life. In the dimly lit meeting room, the team dove headfirst into their mission, focusing intensely. They divided the workload methodically each agent immersing themselves in the comprehensive information they held on the Roosevelt clan, delivered directly to their devices from the Elex Corp. Servers. Their research was exhaustive, but progress was slow. The puzzle they were attempting to assemble was vast and intricate, full of countless pieces that needed careful examination. 
Their materials ranged from various data points and tips to half-vetted pieces of information. There were documents that had surfaced on the black markets, satellite imagery that provided them with a bird's-eye view of their targets, incorporation documents that hinted at the clan's corporate ties, and legislative paperwork that unveiled their political connections. One of their richest sources of data, however, was cross-system communications. Thanks to Elex Corp's control over the ring gates that connected different systems, they had access to an unparalleled stream of communication data. Data transfer in space was a complex process, relying on light beams shuttled between a network of transmitters. However, the ring gates posed a significant challenge. The gates' exotic energies corrupted light beam data, preventing it from passing through. The solution was an ingenious relay system using data ships. Data had to be stored on a physical drive, carried through the ring gates by these ships, and then relayed using light beams on the other side. These ships worked tirelessly, shuttling back and forth through the ring gates, collecting and distributing data. Each gate had a fleet of data ships, with the more populated systems requiring up to ten. This vast operation gave Elex Corp unparalleled access to a wealth of cross-system and inter-system communications. Even local communications, like those from a planet to its moon, would often pass through their transmitters. The only blind spot in their monitoring network was communications within a single planet or station. This left them with a vast trove of data, painting a comprehensive picture of the communications landscape across multiple systems. In a policy that had caused much consternation among politicians across the years, Elix Corp enjoyed the rare privilege of decrypting and analyzing the communication data without needing a warrant. This was permissible as long as they could reasonably assert that their assets might be at risk and that the decrypted communications could aid in their protection. The vague language of this decree, absent of any specific definitions, provided Elix Corp with a broad canvas on which to exercise their power. It was an open secret that this privilege was routinely misused, but without any effective oversight, the status quo remained unchallenged. Aton, despite his discomfort with this unchecked authority, grudgingly acknowledged that it was often wielded for the greater good. Equally important were the intricate interpersonal relationships within the Roosevelt clan. To infiltrate the organization effectively, they needed to understand the dynamics that held the clan together. Who owed allegiance to whom? Where did friction exist? Who would benefit in various scenarios? Aton wasn't a data enthusiast by nature, but he found himself fascinated by this analytical work. Standing at a towering six foot ten, his usual roles had often been limited to BAK breaking work, enforcing authority, and the occasional intimidation. Though the ship's chairs were a poor fit for his frame, pacing the corridors and working through holographic displays added a novel dimension to his day. The team worked independently, each diving into specific aspects of the operation, documented in a shared spreadsheet. When someone made a significant discovery or had valuable insights, they'd convene the team to share their findings. Millie was unraveling the tangled web of connections between the Roosevelt clan and local politicians. She had already identified a dozen politicians evidently on their payroll, and several more who seemed to be indirectly involved. The takeaway here, she declared, is that every politician, whether on the payroll or not, considers the Roosevelt clan's reaction in their decision-making. Every significant conversation I've come across revolves around this. Nothing substantial happens here without their approval. Squad leader Caro was delving into the clan's drug operations. Let me put it this way. The management believes they're running a tight ship, and they are, at the top levels, but a few rungs down, they're openly discussing specifics on the network. Felsen, their hacker, had managed to infiltrate systems previously out of their reach. I've confirmed our suspicions about activities at the primary facilities. They all eventually let something slip. Squad leader, your assessment was spot on, except the larger warehouse also doubles as a vehicle storage and the primary drug staging facility. Interesting, Caro replied. That could be a solid target then. Then there was Agent Millie Calaba. She was in his 40s, a longtime LX security vet. Aton looked up to him. He had been charged with investigating the sex trade. She found 13 buildings throughout the city that were suspected brothels, not to overlook the street ass that they had spread throughout the city. Agent Baird Noun worked to learn more about the personal lives of Roosevelt's leadership 
to see if there was anything they could exploit. There was. A few high-ranking officials had ill family members and might be persuaded by better care for them. A fair number of them were deeply in debt, which was always useful. And interestingly, a captain from the Roosevelts was sleeping with both the wife and the mistress of a rival Skells captain. In fact, he had set out specifically to do it, according to messages that he had sent. That, Caro said as he snapped his fingers, is exactly what we need. Holy shit, exclaimed Molly. Eitan had felt his heart jump. Eitan, you looked into the Askers. Did you find the same? I did not, Aeon said through his scratchy, deep voice. And that is amazing because I did find some other things that would be helpful alongside that. First, the Skells have multiple members that are stealing from the organization. We could apply a little pressure with that. Also, there are two cousins, Rico and Fivio Monero, that are on either side. And last but not least, the leader of the Skells is planning to defect. He wants out and his wife is pregnant. He plans to be gone before we get there. So the situation could change. Hmm, Caro said, stroking the little bit of beard that he had. That is interesting. Makes me not want to rock the boat too hard. But then again, maybe if we rock it hard enough, he ends up staying. I say we expose the affairs as soon as we can. Send a light beam ahead and send the message logs right to the guy who was cheated on directly on his comms unit. Obviously, we will need to make the message anonymous. Really stir up the hornet's nest before we get there. Then we can land and make some moves with some cover. I like it, he replied. I really, really like it. Chapter 4 Aboard the Barak. Headed for the Tevsu system. A knot system. Balas Branch. Navigating through the ring gates followed a uniform, regimented protocol. As a ship made its halfway mark towards the gate, it was standard to execute a flip and commence a deceleration burn. After completing the burn, the spacecraft would then join the orderly queue of waiting ships, patiently biding time for their turn to traverse the gate. Given the inherent lack of visibility on the other side, it was deemed prudent to permit passage of only one ship every 30 minutes or so. The ring gate presented itself as a colossal circular structure, resembling a station in overall look but devoid of human life. The personnel and security squads responsible for overseeing the operations of the gate were stationed on a separate nearby tethered station from where they diligently tracked and controlled the traffic surging through the portal. The gate's core, the section through which ships transited, was eerily dark, an inscrutable abyss masked by a thin veneer that mirrored a thin layer of water. With an absence of backlight, the sheen was elusive, an intriguing, enigmatic glimmer. Suspended in the vacuum of space, the ring gate traced its course around the system's star, much like any other celestial body. The journey to reach a ring gate was dictated by its position in orbit, making it more accessible at certain times than others, depending on its orbital cycle. The gargantuan task of constructing the ring gates was principally the domain of AI drones. Given an average allocation of resources, it would take about six months for the drones to fabricate a gate another six months to create the energy capture systems. Once the physical structure was ready, the wormhole could be generated within the span of a week. This particular ring gate was merely one among hundreds scattered across the cosmos in the ring gate network. Powering up a ring gate demanded an astronomical amount of energy. This energy was harnessed from the radiant light of the star by colossal solar panels, each rivaling the size of entire nations on Earth. These solar panels orbited as close to the star as the limits of their thermal endurance allowed. Upon arrival, a fortunate traveler might find only a handful of ships queued before them, ensuring passage within a few hours. However, luck could also tilt the other way, extending the wait to a couple of days, especially in the more frequented systems. Aton, a veteran of the Council's Navy, had experienced his fair share of such long and tiresome waits. Luckily, the Barak, the Elex security cargo ship that had been designed to look like a civilian hauler didn't have to wait long to begin the transit through the ring gate into the Hydra system. With the extra power for all the additional weight, an unloaded hauler would make the perfect passing through the ring gate had always been a bad time for Aton. He couldn't remember a time when he hadn't vomited. All-encompassing vertigo hit him right as they hit the precipice for the ring every time without fail. 
Inside the ship, there was no discernible difference. Nothing seemed to change as they passed through, aside falling ill when you passed through the ring gate was very common. Transport ships had ample barf bags available for every seat, although Aton usually preferred to transit over a toilet and this time was no different. The actual act of passing through only took about 10 minutes. Ships were asked to move through at a snail's pace, so that is how long the ship took to get through. If you were moving at typical speeds, transit would only take a fraction of a millisecond, but sending ships hurtling blindly into the connected system was deemed too dangerous, although it occurred to Aton as he projectile vomited that he would have preferred it. Goddamn Aton, that was a loud one, Caro said through an ear-to-ear -ear grin. Yeah, Aton replied and pulled his long hair back from his face. Millie walked over and gave Aton a hard slap on the back. Just think, three more of those until we get to Tevsu, Aton moaned. Aton loved the autonomy that Elek's security team were given. They were valued, trusted even. Elek's understood that while allowing that kind of freedom was a risk, they were still capable of delivering higher results. The whole squad had watched the communications logs explode when the message logs had arrived. Immediately, the Roosevelt captain left looking for the Skell captain that was banging his wife and mistress. Tell me where the fuck he is right now, one message said. He had also sent a barrage of text messages to his wife who had seemingly disappeared. Molly speculated the wife was bedded with the Skell captain. They watched as the ripple effects went out between the organizations. They had an incomplete picture as they could only see messages that were routed through their transmitters. Luckily, Felsen had been able to gain at least partial access to the local network down on the planet so they had decent insight into what was happening on the ground. Everyone was talking about it. Their families. Everyone within the organization. There was lots of speculation of violent retorts, and maybe an order had gone out that they didn't have access to, but for the most part it seemed that the Roosevelt management preferred that the issue went away. Interestingly, the wife of the man was nowhere to be found. Although they originally thought that she might be shacked up with the Skell Capo that she was having an affair with, Later, they received a notification that she had hopped on a shuttle to the Bartone spaceport, then would board a transport ship to the Vanna system, where she had family. She was out. That made Aton and the rest of the team feel good. They were worried that she might get hurt. Luckily, once the news broke, it seems that she had better sense than to go home. Someone probably helped her get away. Might have been the Scale Capo. Maybe another lover. But someone did. And that was good. The next few weeks on the way in, they let things simmer. They wanted to stir the pot, but not to let the situation get out of control before they were even on the ground. As it turned out, since the wife had hightailed it as soon as word of her affair broke, there wasn't a whole lot of fallout. That is, until they were about a week out, fresh out of the ring gate in the Tevsu system. The aggrieved husband had been out at a bar when he had seen the Skel Capo that his wife had had an affair with. He'd walked over in broad daylight and put two into his head, leaving him slumped in his deep-fried mushroom appetizer. Immediately, things exploded. He had run away, presumably slept it off, and then gone into hiding. The Skells were hunting for him, and the management of either organization was working furiously to ensure that an isolated incident didn't turn into a full-blown war. For their part in it, the squad couldn't have been happier with the outcome. When, after almost seven weeks of flying and five puking sessions at the ring gates, they arrived at the Bartone spaceport, orbiting the icy moon of the same name. There, their ship was unloaded and then docked in the moorage floating a few dozen miles away, and they rode a transport ship down to the planet's surface. The transport ship, a sleek silver vessel, descended from the star-studded expanse of the alien sky. Its hull, polished to a mirror sheen, reflected the stark, unending desert below and the vibrant city that rose like a mirage from its heart. The city was a grand spectacle, a testament to the architectural prowess of its builders. Its design was a harmonious blend of traditional Middle Eastern aesthetics and advanced alien technology, creating a unique, captivating landscape. The city was encased within a colossal dome, a protective shell that shielded its inhabitants from the harsh desert environment. The dome was a marvel of engineering, a translucent barrier that shimmered under the alien sun, casting a soft golden glow over the city. From afar, it resembled a giant pearl nestled in the heart of the desert, 
a beacon of civilization amidst the barren wilderness. As the transport ship drew closer, the city's intricate details came into view. The buildings were adorned with ornate patterns, their walls etched with intricate geometric designs that seemed to dance in the sunlight. The city was alive with activity, its inhabitants moving about their day, their colorful attire adding to the city's vibrant palette. The ship made its way toward the spaceport, a sprawling complex located at the city's edge. The spaceport was a hub of activity, with ships of all shapes and sizes coming and going, their engines roaring in a symphony of interstellar travel. The transport ship touched down gently, its engines humming softly as it settled on the landing pad. Chapter 5 Soli City Planet Sanion Tevsu System Balas Branch Alex had arranged for them to stay in a ribbon of low-slung apartments, sandwiched between the east side's craggy outcrops and the bustling commercial district. The steel and glass structures, scorched by the relentless desert sun, were in the vicinity of their designated warehouse, a behemoth of rust and concrete that sat humming with illicit activity. Just a few miles away, the drone of the spaceport formed an ever-present soundtrack, interlaced with the occasional roar of spacecraft taking off or landing. Aton found his new home comfortable. Nestled within one of the city's densest gastronomic hotspots, the mishmash of neon-lit eateries and grungy food stalls, featuring exotic cuisine from a myriad of star systems, gave him something to look forward to. Aton was always down for some good eats. The suites themselves were pragmatic, compact spaces designed with efficiency in mind. Each contained a pair of narrow bedrooms outfitted with hardened foam mattresses, outfitted with the bare essentials, and a streamlined kitchenette equipped with a nutrient synthesizer and a mini refrigeration unit. A potable water supply was non-existent, a harsh reminder of the criminal administration's neglect of basic utilities. Drinking the water on a planet suffocating under the thumb of such syndicates was as hazardous as gambling with loaded dice. There were water stalls scattered around the city where you could load large jugs with fresh drinking water. Their apartment had two of the jugs sitting in the living room full. Aton and Millie were rooming together. Millie, quick to assert her preference, had claimed the bedroom nearest to the basic sanitization chamber, an antiquated model that recycled and sterilized water for bathing. A perpetual scent of arid dust pervaded their living quarters, seeping into fabric and machinery alike, a constant reminder of their barren environs. Each time one ventured outside for a breather, the relentless desert would lay claim, its gritty particles infiltrating every gap and pore. Where verdant vegetation was a rarity on the desert planet, it found refuge inside the protective domes. Clusters of trees, hardy off-world species genetically modified to survive in this harsh environment, added splotches of greenery in the otherwise monochromatic landscape. Beyond the protective barrier of the dome, the planetary environment was a tempest of extreme temperatures. The nights could plummet to a bone-chilling minus 10 degrees Celsius, while the days could skyrocket to an infernal 70 degrees. Without a heat-regulating suit, a design of engineered fabric interspersed with thermoreactive cells, stepping outside was akin to a death wish. Even with these precautions, one had to be always ready, for the desert was not known for its hospitality. The start of their covert mission was predictably monotonous. As was customary with any new undercover deployment involving Alex security, it was necessary to cultivate a consistent routine, an unremarkable pattern to weave themselves seamlessly into the local fabric. Despite its remote location, far down the sprawling cosmic branch, the town was of substantial size, large enough to have its own bustling life, but not so sprawling that new faces could go unnoticed for long particularly a face belonging to a body as towering as Aton's. No matter where you found yourself in the ring network, a six-foot, ten-inches silhouette was bound to draw attention. And so, they ventured into their adopted roles with calculated caution, always in sight, yet never seen together beyond the limits of their individual apartments. Each morning, as the reddish hues of the planet's dawn leaked into the dome, Aton would pull himself out of bed, throw on a trench coat and hat, and set off to the scrapyard that lay inside of a second bubble of the dome. Of all the team members, Aton's morning trek was the most demanding. 
His route was a grand promenade that cut across the city, a long and winding journey that exposed him to the curious eyes of the town's inhabitants. But it was a necessary spectacle. His imposing size demanded a familiarization strategy, to be seen, to be recognized, and ultimately, to be overlooked as a common part of their everyday landscape. His destination, the scrapyard, was a sprawling field of mechanical decay. It was a graveyard for technology, filled to the brim with the skeletal remains of various machines, derelict spacecrafts, defunct drones, stripped-down solar bikes, and countless other artifacts of alien engineering. Amid the rusted hulks and broken gears, Aton found his place, a striking figure amidst a sea of forgotten technology. Every morning, as Aton, or Jay Corda as he was known in this arid city, stepped foot into the vast scrapyard, the owner would acknowledge him with a habitual, Morning, Jay. His alias, Jay Corda, was a simple trader hailing from Vanna, three systems closer to the core along the ballast branch. His fabricated backstory was an ingenious smokescreen. He was merely biding his time in Soli, awaiting the arrival of his brother who owned an interstellar freight company, expected to dock in a few months. This narrative provided him with a solid alibi for his extended stay in the town without arousing undue suspicion. Initially, he was anxious about having to introduce this phantom sibling, but soon discovered that the locals had little interest in the minutiae of his stay. Assuming the persona of a freelance hauler and a collector of rare machinery components, Aton's routine entailed daily scavenging missions into the graveyard of machines. He'd search for valuable parts, buying them with the team's allotted budget, all the while providing an abundance of fictitious details about himself to the scrapyard owner. Aton suspected the owner had connections with the Skells and Roosevelts, the crime syndicates of the city, and a well-rehearsed backstory was his shield against their probing queries. During these daily treks through the city, his thoughts would often wander back to his home and family. He'd think of his mother, her warm embrace and soft voice, and his father, who had succumbed to the merciless desert lung a few years prior. His siblings, Rand and Tony, haunted his thoughts too. Their lives had spiraled into tumult after his departure to join the Council's navy. Falling into a shady crowd back in the Varda system, they had repeatedly needed financial help from Aton. He never begrudged them the assistance. His primary concern was their safety. A latent yearning for home was a constant companion to Aton, a gentle ache that was ever present since his decision to leave. It nipped and gnawed at him sporadically, its pull more potent during his days in the Council's navy. However, after transitioning to Ellick's security, he found a sense of purpose that slightly eased this longing. In his heart, Aton aspired to improve the situation in the Ballas branch, especially the back half of the branch where the most recent colonies had taken root. These nascent systems were resource-starved, struggling to establish themselves. His home, Varda, was the farthest system on the Ballas branch and the newest addition, having been colonized a mere century and a half ago. His drive was fueled by the hope to enhance the living conditions in these fledgling systems. His dreams were of a thriving Varda, a testament to the resilience of its inhabitants. Life on Varda, Aton's home planet, was no cakewalk. Hunger was an often unwelcome guest, making frequent appearances whenever the delicate supply chain suffered a hiccup. Perched eleven systems away from Sol, the epicenter of the core systems and humanity's original home, Varda was not an easy reach. A direct journey took roughly four long months, a duration that saw essential commodities taking an eternity to arrive. Living at the tail end of any cosmic branch presented its unique set of challenges, and Ballas, being the most recent, was no exception. Food variety was an alien concept, with a limited array of edibles that were a far cry from the plentiful choices available closer to the core. Dependable tech was a rare find, and even crucial medicines were an unpredictable luxury. Such scarcity drove Aton to the brink of frustration. The opening of the ring gates had come with a multitude of promises, lucrative incentives for relocation, land grants, programs to promote rapid family expansion, and an enticing image of a superior future. Yet over time, the shiny veneer of these promises had tarnished, revealing an ugly truth. The far-flung systems, once the frontiers of galactic expansion, had been neglected, 
and left to wither into cesspools of criminal activities and rampant substance abuse. Aton was determined to reverse this downfall. In Elex Corp, Aton found his best shot at instigating change. Their interests aligned. They too sought stability across all interconnected systems within the ring network. Such stability translated to better quality of life for the inhabitants, and this was a cause Aton deemed worthy enough to wage a battle for. And Elex was the only entity with enough power to make that happen, along with a fiscal interest in doing so. The High Council was too caught up in the affairs of the Corps to pay much attention to anything happening in the branches. His current assignment, dismantling the nefarious Roosevelt clan, was a mission that resonated deeply with him. As long as the Roosevelts held sway over the system, the possibility of a stable future for the inhabitants was a distant dream. Some might argue that displacing the Roosevelts might result in a power vacuum, potentially paving the way for a worse entity to seize control. This was a valid concern, except in this case, Aton knew Elex had plans in place. Once the Roosevelts were flushed out from Tevsu, Elex was poised to swoop in with a hidden iron fist, ensuring stability and an equitable, if conservative, rule. Though not explicitly mentioned in their briefings, Aton was certain of the impending developments. The puppet government they had installed had crumbled spectacularly under the weight of its incompetence. Organized crime had infiltrated every tier of the system's operations, profiteering at a staggering pace. Whether this state of affairs was a product of sheer incompetence or deliberate complicity was still a matter of conjecture. Uncovering any evidence of Prime Minister Perote's potential collaboration with these syndicates was an integral part of their platoon's mandate. Regardless, his fate was sealed, either a swift death or a disgraceful ousting from power, depending on the answers to those questions. Once the Prime Minister was unseated, Elex Corp would swoop in, a new government would be installed, and a tidal wave of capital would be injected into the system. This was their way of ensuring that the system would not plunge back into a chaotic abyss. However, the nature of their work was cyclical. Eventually, Elex's priorities would shift, their attention would waver, and their vigilance would slacken. They couldn't be omnipresent, and inevitably, the system would start its slow and steady descent back into anarchy, until the cycle of intervention was triggered once again. Such was the paradox of working for Elex's security always striving to mend the problems, yet always grappling with the ephemeral nature of their solutions, continuously battling against the currents of human proclivities. While on the planet, communication outside their secure network was limited to decoy dialogues meant to mislead any potential eavesdroppers. Millie might call Aton to discuss dinner plans or his daily schedule, simple mundane conversations that would present an illusion of normalcy to anyone spying on them. These ruses were designed to reinforce their covert identities and maintain the charade of their normalcy. After their planned public appearances, they'd get back to their units and the real work would begin. They had an AI sifting through the collected communications data and flagging anything that might be interesting. Of course, no AI was perfect. There were nuances in the way that humans spoke and wrote that were difficult for an AI to truly understand when it hadn't been fully trained on dialogue from that particular planet or system. But the AI was very effective at finding patterns. Within a few minutes of being switched on, it had already identified many of their coded lingo in their drug and prostitution operations. Agent Felsen grinned big and put the AI's findings up on the screen. Isn't she smart? He asked. Epic was Coda the primary drug that they sold. Vits were prostitutes. Safe was a stash house. The list scrolled. There were dozens. Some of them were obviously just local lingo. Others were definitely code words. On your comms units, you'll see a new folder with a few days' worth of communications to analyze. Our goal right now is to learn. Every couple of days, when you have something interesting, you're going to give a presentation, just like we did on the ship. Now that we are here... Immersed in the culture of Saneon, we can get a better feel for what is going on. It will help us spot our move when we see it. An opportunity will present itself somewhere, a way that we can cause chaos. Put a chink in their armor. The tension between the two groups is high. We need to tug at that that any way that we can. But until then, we learn. So when we see this opportunity, we are able to recognize it. The team fell into a rhythm 
maintaining their daily operations as they had been instructed. Each morning, Eitan embarked on his habitual stroll to the scrapyard, a routine that had become as familiar as breathing. Upon returning, he'd bury himself in hours of eavesdropping on calls or sifting through intercepted messages. His diligent note-taking soon turned into a treasure trove of valuable insights. Merely weeks into their mission, the team began to unravel the intricate web spun within the power circles of the Skells and the Roosevelts in Sanion. They managed to identify simmering resentments brewing among the ranks on both sides, offering them potential leverage points. However, capitalizing on these internal beefs would entail significant risks. The last thing they wanted was for their covert presence to be exposed, and they were under orders to proceed with caution. And so, they did inching forward carefully until a chance remark sparked their interest. One Skell captain, Cal Katoon, had made an intriguing comment in a message to his off-world mother. I'm going to the dentist on Friday at one for automated cleaning. Dr. Wolin. Eitan was familiar with Wolin's dentistry. He had passed by it daily on his walks. Cal Katoon was not an unknown figure either. A boisterous, audacious captain, Katoon was notorious for his aggressive push towards war with the Skells following the affair incident. His logs also revealed a history of alcohol-fueled brawls with fellow Roosevelt members scattered across the city. This seemingly innocuous dentist appointment, therefore, presented a tantalizing lead that warranted further investigation. Hey, Millie! Eitan's voice boomed through the confines of their compact apartment, ricocheting off the sparse, minimalist decor. Yeah, she replied from the other room. Cal Katoon, he's the Roosevelt guy your contact despised, right? He sure is. Raj Denari had a bone to pick with him. Apparently he'd stolen a shipment bound for his shop and left him footing the bill, and he's been hiding from him ever since. Reckoned he was a loose cannon who could spark a war, and honestly, he wasn't far off the mark. Didn't you mention Raj worked in the Commerce District? Managed some store down there? That's right, why? A wisp of a smirk curled up Eitan's lips. Seems our dear friend Cal Katoon is due for a dental visit at Wolin's Dentistry. Coincidentally, it's located less than a block from Raj's apartment and two blocks from his shop. The thud of Millie getting out of bed followed by the soft patter of her feet moving quickly across the apartment floor could be heard. Suddenly, she skidded into the room, socks sliding against the cold floor, her blonde hair trailing like a comet's tail. Eyes wide and sparkling with anticipation, she exclaimed, Oh, damn, this is the one, she said, her voice quivering with a cocktail of excitement and adrenaline. Chapter 6. Soli City. Planet Seneon. Tevsu System. Balas Branch. Squad leader Karo Forn, a short but stout man, sat hunched over a dimly lit desk. The apartment's ambient LED lights cast elongated shadows that danced on the sleek metal walls as he thumbed through the holographic communications pages. Each translucent sheet revealed a labyrinth of text, encrypted conversations, and data trails that he devoured. So this is promising, he said, his voice bouncing off the cold, metallic surfaces of the apartment he shared with Agent Felsen. The apartment was austere its muted grays and steely blues emphasizing its functional nature over any comfort or aesthetics. Let's play it out. What's our angle with this newfound info? Felsen, lounging on a rigid couch of synthetic fabric, pursed his lips, deep in thought. We have Raj and Cal within blocks of each other, and they can't stand each other. And Raj has been looking for him to get his debt paid. What's the play here? Coax them into a chance encounter and pray they duke it out to the death? Caro let out a cynical chuckle. If only. Felsen drummed his fingers against the armrest, his brain whirring. We could give them a reason, perhaps. Plant a seed of discord and then orchestrate their meat. Maybe send one a provocative message pretending to be the other. Aton, cradling a steaming mug of bitter space coffee, interjected from across the room. That's a risk, he cautioned. There's the risk they discover the text didn't originate from each other. They'd figure someone was fucking with them and be on high alert. Caro nodded thoughtfully, his sharp eyes never straying from the ever-expanding web of communications logs on the holographic display. A valid point, he conceded. But they may just blame the Skells. Aton took a slow sip of his coffee, 
the warmth of the mug a stark contrast to the cool air of their habitation. Even if we maneuver them into crossing paths, there's no guarantee they do anything to each other. Also true, Caro mused, leaning back in his chair and running a hand through his close-cropped hair. So why do it? Because they despise each other, Millie chimed in, her voice resolute. Caro raised an eyebrow. And? His voice trailed off, leaving her simplistic reasoning floating in the air like an exposed flaw. Millie shrugged slightly, a cheeky smile playing on her lips. And maybe they'll end up killing each other? Caro leaned forward again, resting his elbows on the desk. Yes, and what's the potential aftermath? Millie paused, her cheeks flushing a shade of pink under the scrutiny. Oh, a gang war could erupt, she admitted, her confidence faltering under Caro's intent gaze. It wasn't like him to single out a team member for criticism. His leadership style was typically more relaxed. Caro was one to step in only when someone slipped up, preferring to guide with fairness and reason, a trait that Aton had always appreciated. Sounds like a long shot, doesn't it, Agent? Aton queried, shifting uncomfortably in the too small, cold plastic chair. Caro just grunted in agreement. It does. He began to pace the length of the room, the hum of the central air cooling system filling the silence. His footsteps echoed against the austere metal floor, creating a rhythmic tick-tock that reverberated within the confines of their metallic hideaway. Caro was known for these bouts of thoughtful silence, using them as an unspoken invitation for others to speak up. But this time, no one took the bait. But then again, he began, his voice slicing through the thick silence. To achieve our goal, we don't necessarily need one to kill the other, do we? We just need the opposite gang to believe it happened that way. A cold realization settled in Aton's gut, sending a shiver up his spine. He had known from the onset that this mission wouldn't be bloodless. Still, he had hoped. You're suggesting we off one of them? Felsen asked, his voice betraying a hint of disbelief. Caro flashed a wicked grin, his eyes gleaming with unspoken mischief. I'm not not suggesting that. I believe it merits a discussion. It's no secret they despise each other, and their respective gangs are well aware of it too. Given that they will be so close to one another, if one suddenly ends up dead and someone begins sniffing around surveillance footage, wouldn't they draw their own conclusions? Felsen's hand shot up almost instinctively. Caro simply chuckled. This isn't grade school, Agent Felsen. You don't need to raise your hand. Apologies, squad leader, Felsen mumbled. And no need for apologies either, Caro added, his grin widening. Felsen cleared his throat. Um, if we can navigate smartly and selectively erase some surveillance footage in the vicinity, we could probably sneak our team in and out. We obviously can't wipe out all the footage, but if we erase anything showing our operatives within, say, a four-block radius, they'd be none the wiser. Caro's eyes sparkled with interest, and he pointed at Felsen. Now that's some solid thinking. Aton piped up. Do we necessarily have to kill him? Couldn't we just kidnap him? Caro let out a hearty laugh. Kidnap? You can't be serious. Where would we hold him? In your apartment? He'd see our faces. We'd need to feed him. I refuse to house any of those men in the same apartment as me, Millie piped up, shaking her head vehemently. Aton, flustered, conceded. Okay, okay, I get it. Bad idea. He ran a hand through his long brown hair in frustration. But how would we even execute this plan? Aton could feel a trickle of sweat wind its way down his forehead, slipping down his face. He wasn't sure whether it was the talk of assassination that made his skin clammy, or the inadequate air conditioning in the metal box they were huddled in, a structure marooned within a dome exposed to the relentless baking heat of an alien planet's thin atmosphere. Don't make it more complex than it needs to be. Millie suggested with a casual shrug of her shoulders. She leaned back in her chair, her attitude nonchalant. Cal has a dental appointment scheduled. Raj will either be at his store or in his apartment. We just wait for Cal to leave his appointment, then we execute him right there on the spot. Swift, clean, and efficient. Aton felt a shiver crawl up his spine as he observed Millie's effortless composure during the discussion. She was a veteran, having served a decade with Alex's security, and experienced numerous bouts of combat. However, Aton had only accompanied her on their last two missions, both of which were laid-back humanitarian endeavors. He had never witnessed this side of her before. 
He had always believed her toughness to be a show. Apparently, it wasn't. No, that won't work, Felsen interjected from his corner of the room, his fingers dancing over a holographic interface as he sifted through a matrix of security feeds he had managed to hack into. The street is riddled with cameras with clear vantage points of the area. We wouldn't be able to wipe all the footage in time. They would likely seize it quickly, and I don't like the odds of tampering with all of them before they secure the files. Mid-sentence, Felsen's voice hitched, his eyes widening as they locked onto a particular feed showcasing a blueprint of the dentist's building. Oh, look here. There's a side door. And, yes, no cameras in that direction, just a narrow alleyway, maybe eight feet wide between the dental office and the adjacent building, and there are no other exits in the entire alley. Flicking his wrist with practiced ease, Felsen projected the blueprint onto the wall for all to examine. There it is, Caro said, squinting at the blueprint. Millie was quick to retort. Sure, but he's not going to use that door. I walk past that building every day while making my rounds. The reception is right at the front. I'm not sure where the side door leads, but I don't think we should bank on him using it. Point taken, Caro conceded, running a hand through his hair. What if we could maneuver Cal to exit through that side door? Aton's chuckle cut through the tension in the room. What? Are we going to stage a road construction on the main entrance? Seems like that would be a suspicious move, don't you think? You have a point. If there are ten cameras trained on the main doors, we can't risk making an appearance on that street at all, Caro admitted. Felsen, can you draft a route for us? How do we get to that alley without catching any camera attention? Marcy, plot the course, Felsen instructed his communications unit. Millie squinted at him, a confused grin spreading on her face. You, you named your AI Marcy? Barely raising his head from his unit, Felsen watched the display as it generated thousands of possible routes onto the wall. He answered Millie with a casual shrug. Yep, high school sweetheart. Millie just shook her head, disbelief mixed with amusement. Jesus fucking Christ, she muttered under her breath. Here, Felsen said, his attention drawn back to his interface. This looks surprisingly promising. Aton, it even mirrors the path you take during your morning walks to the scrapyard. A cold knot formed in Aton's stomach. He knew what was coming next. You make a turn here on Block Street. Stick to the right side to avoid camera exposure. Turn right again and voila, the alleyway is no more than 40 yards ahead, Felsen outlined as the AI traced the path on the projected screen. We would only need to wipe footage from a maximum of four cameras, three if we're lucky. I like it. I like it a lot. But we still have a hurdle, ensuring Cal uses the side door. If he chooses the front, our plan collapses. Millie swiveled to face Felsen, a new fire in her eyes. What does the door look like? Felsen held up a finger signaling for patience as he worked on pulling up the relevant surveillance feed. In a few moments, the screen displayed an image of the door. Metal. That simplifies things. We could remotely apply some hull weld gel onto the door and its surrounding wall using a drone. Just a few squirts should do it. The door will seamlessly blend into the wall, and Cal will have no choice but to find an alternative exit. Caro clapped his hands together with a resounding echo, a grin spreading across his face. Millie, you're a bloody genius. That is exactly what we're going to do. Now let's work this out. Cal goes in for his dentist appointment. He gets his cavity filled or whatever the hell he's there for. The gel takes around two minutes to set, so we need a pair of eyes on him during his appointment to determine the precise moment to apply it. If we jump the gun, we risk increasing foot traffic from the side door. Felsen's grin was like a Cheshire cat's. No problem, he said confidently. I've already hacked into the surveillance system at Wolin's dentistry. We can monitor his movements and even eavesdrop if necessary. Brilliant, absolutely bloody brilliant, Carol replied, his arms crossed and an unmistakable air of satisfaction surrounding him. So, we have Itan tracing the route mapped out by Felsen's artificially intelligent high school sweetheart, Marcy. He positions himself in the alley a few minutes before Cal's appointment concludes. Roughly three to four minutes before the end, we deploy the hull weld gel. That should give it time to cure. Then Cal tries to leave through the front door. It's like walking into a solid steel wall. So he turns back, communicates his predicament to the front desk attendant, who directs him towards the side exit.
He walks out, Aiton takes his shot, and then simply retraces his steps back through the alley. Aitan felt as if his heart had plummeted to his feet. He started to interject, um, Millie cut him off, raising a single problematic point. One hitch in this otherwise flawless plan, she said. Raj will likely be in his shop two blocks away on camera. If that's the case, no one is going to believe he killed him. Caro blinked, realization sinking in. Oh, yeah, that's right, he said. We got so engrossed in the plan, we overlooked that minor detail. Felsen, any chance you can tamper with the footage from Raj's store? Felsen frowned, shaking his head. I haven't been able to infiltrate their system yet, and I'm not certain they even have surveillance in there, considering he's part of a crime syndicate. Caro nodded, understanding. Considering we suspect the store is a front for contraband operations, it would make sense, but we can't rely on that. We know they have cameras installed in other locations that we've yet to access, so for the time being we must proceed under the assumption they also have one in the store. So we need to lure Raj out of his store and away from any surveillance about five minutes before Cal's scheduled execution, Millie summarized. How in the hell are we going to manage that? Aton was about to answer, the sweat practically streaming down his face when Caro cut in. Where is the safest place to have him off camera? From the rear of the room, Felsen muttered his response, his voice barely above a whisper. The alley? Absolutely. Felsen, you're really on the ball today. Caro praised, a hint of amusement in his voice. Consider this. We send him a text message, maybe right after Aton passes past the store. Inform Raj that Cal is in the adjacent alley. If he hurries over, he'll stumble upon a freshly committed murder scene. Plus, we'll have multiple videos of him heading towards the scene. Aton felt his heart racing against his ribcage. They had all moved forward without a moment's hesitation. Was the decision made just like that? It couldn't possibly be. That might work. Do you believe he'll fall for it? How are we framing this message? Millie queried. Felsen chimed in. We could pretend to be Cal sending the text, just ask him to meet up in the alley. Millie shook her head. I'm not sure about that. If you were in his shoes, would you agree to meet your sworn enemy from a rival gang in an alley just because he asked you to? Felsen acknowledged her point with a raised hand. Fair point, he conceded, but he has been looking for him. But what if we took a different approach, Carol proposed. What if we made the situation so dire that he couldn't ignore it? Suppose we told him a family member as in the alley, the we being Cal Katoon, of course. That might work. He does have family, a mother, a brother, a daughter. His brother will be with him at the shop. What about his daughter? Hey, Aton attempted to interject, only to be ignored. Usually she's at a daycare about... 20 blocks from here, Millie supplied. All right, let's visualize this. He's at his store. Then we send Raj a text pretending to be Cal. We tell him we're in the alleyway behind Wolin Dental and we've kidnapped his daughter. Then Aton executes Cal just before Raj would arrive. When I verbalize it, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Yet it's absurd enough that he might believe it's genuine. If someone threatened my daughter, I'd run to the alley. I wouldn't call anyone first. I like it, Millie agreed. Me too. Worst case scenario, if he doesn't leave his store, the suspicious text message could muddy the waters as they look into things. Our anonymous lines are outside of their network, so they'll have no idea who sent it. Hey! Aton suddenly raised his voice, causing a startled silence in the room. Everyone's gaze was drawn to the colossal man. When he raised his voice, it was difficult to ignore. When did we agree that I was the one who's going to pull the trigger? Uh... Well, it's your route, isn't it? You'd fit right in. You go that way every day at that time. I assumed you would want to, don't you? It's not that, Aton replied, dropping his gaze a bit. I've never killed anyone before. Oh, oh, damn, really? Caro asked, genuinely surprised. What the fuck? Millie blurted from behind him. You served in the council's navy? Caro's eyes held genuine curiosity as he asked the question. That was mostly humanitarian aid and standing around, was involved in a couple of firefights while distributing aid in conflict zones, but never knew for certain if I actually hit anyone. And you've been with Ellick's security for how long now? Two and a half years. Right. So you've participated in what? Three squad missions, two protection missions, and that incident with the pirates who surrendered without firing a shot. 
I guess it's true, you've never taken a life. That's correct. But you enjoy working for Elex Security, don't you? I do. And you intend to continue working here? Caro asked. Yes, Aton replied. Well, there's no point in trying to preserve your innocence, Agent Finley. This job will eventually involve killing. I've been here for 15 years, and I've killed more than a handful. What about you, Millie? I stopped counting. Really, why? Aton asked, his interest piqued. I didn't want to keep track. Maybe it didn't matter to me. I don't know, she said with a shrug. Then it's settled. We have our plan, and tomorrow Aton experiences the grim reality of our profession for the first time. The looming dread Aton felt upon hearing those words was hard to articulate. It was all consuming. He had known this day would arrive, and had even been mentally preparing for it. Yet a part of him had always hoped, however naively, that it would never come to pass. Chapter 7 Soli City, Planet Sanion, Tevsu System, Ballas Branch That night, in the confines of his apartment bedroom, Eitan endured one of the most harrowing nights of his life, rivaling even the day he learned about his father's demise. He tossed and turned restlessly, the task ahead of him relentlessly occupying his mind. He repeatedly visualized the scenario in his head. He pondered over how Cal Katoon's face might look when he would draw his weapon and pull the trigger. What would the man utter in his final moments? What if he missed? What if he was spotted? An endless stream of scenarios played out in Aton's mind. Cal Katoon deserved it, or so he tried to convince himself. Katoon had opted for a life mired in criminal activities. His crew consisted of murderers, brutal enforcers, and human traffickers. It was inevitable, if not from Aton, then someone else would be his executioner eventually, perhaps Raj. The reality was that Aton had been nervously anticipating this day, the day he would kill for the first time. He was acutely aware that it was a question of when, not if. However, he had breathed a sigh of relief when his initial missions were assigned, comforted by the minimal risk of violent confrontation. Still, Aton had somehow assumed that his first kill would transpire differently, perhaps during a mission gone awry an unfortunate yet common occurrence in his line of work. It would have been easier that way. He had never envisaged that his first kill would be a premeditated one, an event he would be mentally grappling with 48 hours in advance. It left him with too much time to brood over it. Secretly, he wondered whether Caro had intentionally planned it this way. Despite their friendship, Caro was his squad leader, responsible for molding him into the best possible agent. The idea of Caro manipulating situations more than it appeared on the surface didn't seem far-fetched to Aton. Throughout the night, Aton may have dozed off momentarily, but he wasn't certain. Not that it mattered much, as his dreams were filled with the image of killing Cal. He woke from his troubled slumber about seven hours after he initially tried to sleep. Despite feeling exhausted, Aton found himself mentally better equipped for the day's challenge. Caro had sent him a message early that morning informing him that they'd conduct a walkthrough roughly an hour after he woke up. They all congregated at Caro's apartment, situated a mere block away from Aton's, marking one of the rare occasions they were seen together. Their recent frequent meetings made Aton hope it hadn't drawn any undue attention. When was the last time you wore leg augments? Caro asked Aton. During the Council's Navy humanitarian missions, we used them for loading and unloading. Never in combat? Never. All right, then. You'll wear them today. They are in that box, he said, as he pointed toward the large crate on the side of the room. Keep them under your clothes, obviously. We don't want people seeing you wearing that. But if shit goes south, you start running and you let those bad boys do the rest. How do they work again? Aton asked. They augment your own strength, and I'd imagine you have pretty strong legs. Basically, whatever your top running speed is, double that. You'll be able to outrun any land speeder in a city environment. Sweet, Aton said as he walked over and began rummaging through the box. Today, we will go through the whole process. Aton will walk down there, following the route that he will walk tomorrow, all the way to the alley, where you will sit for five minutes, then walk back just like you will. We won't put the drone up in the air because we don't want to risk it being seen. Also, Aton, we made some decisions about positioning. 
Since you'll be able to haul ass in those leg augments, Millie, Felson, and Witcher will all be about six blocks away from you in different directions. Millie will be in the small trade square. Felson will be at the currency exchange. Witcher will be sitting in a bar to the north. Close enough to get to you if something happens, but not so close as to show up on any cameras when they look into what happened here. Sounds good to me. All right, then. Everyone to your positions. Aton had some trouble getting the leg augments on. It had been a while. They were metallic and didn't look too different from a pair of leg braces. The primary difference here was that these had hydraulics and were made form a smart synthetic metal that could conform to the shape of Aiton's legs. They learned from him as he walked and became more comfortable and more effective the longer that he wore them. Minutes later, Aton was standing in front of the door to his own apartment buildings, wearing a pair of pants that were slightly more baggy than usual to accommodate the leg enhancements that he was wearing below them. It shocked him how surprisingly comfortable they were. The sun beat down on him. Even in the somewhat climate-controlled dome, a hot day with the in the dome meant that things were going to get spicy. A few minutes later, he received a ping from Millie on his communication unit. She was asking if he could try to pick up some mushroom meat for dinner. That was his cue, and he took off walking. Today was a particularly dusty day in the Sanion Dome City. Typically, the filtration systems would take out most of the particles in the air, but when it got hot enough, there was no stopping it. Aton could feel the particles sticking in his nose as he breathed. They went through the walkthrough, and everything went to plan. Felsen transferred the walking route directly to his comms unit and checked the different cameras as he walked. There was a ridiculous series of twists and turns that he could make to avoid them almost completely. As he walked, Aton tried to notice whatever he could about the different locations, storefronts, balconies, apartments, just in case he needed somewhere to lay low. He reached the alley without issue and sat down for a minute, taking it all in. The wall across from him was, or at least had been, metallic at one point. Now it was caked in layers of dust that seemed to be inches thick. The building behind him, where Wolan Dentistry was located, was metallic as well, but had been maintained better than the wall. This is where he would kill Smeewan in just a few short hours. He took a deep breath and let that idea wash over him like a wave. He wondered what his mother would think of this. He'd never tell her. But he knew how heartbroken she'd be to hear what he'd done. Aton stood up, dusted off the back of his black pants, and headed back the way he came. He returned to Carlos' apartment about 25 minutes later. He took the scenic route and made sure people noticed him so maybe they wouldn't the next day. You barely appeared on anything, on any camera until the end there, Felsen said. I think we are good to go. The only thing that can fuck this up is if the drone shooting the hull weld gel doesn't seal the door. But then Cal lives and no one is the wiser. No loss aside from the opportunity, Baird said. The plan is solid, Caro said nodding and striking a more serious tone than usual. Are you ready, Agent Finley? You know it was serious when he addressed you formally. I am, sir, Aton lied. Chapter 8. Soli City, Planet Sanian Tevsu System, Ballast Branch. The moment Aton woke up, a churning unease consumed him, a mix of anxiety and nervousness gnawing at him. Sleep had been sporadic the previous night, but despite the insomnia, he dreamt. They weren't supposed to communicate during the operation, minimizing any possible digital traces. Squad leader Forn had instructed Aton to wear camera goggles to provide a live feed of the unfolding events. For breakfast, Aton ate mushroom sausage and a strong coffee, or at least Saneon's imitation of coffee. Although he struggled to eat through his knotted stomach, he managed to force down his meal. He fitted the leg augmentations under his clothes, pacing his room to adjust to the feel before heading out. He hoped he wouldn't have to activate them. He decided to don a long trench coat. While it couldn't truly disguise his large frame, it was a minor attempt at concealment and would also shield him from the sun's harsh glare. His hands trembled slightly as he buttoned up the coat. He hadn't seen Millie that morning. She'd likely risen early to discuss their role in the operation's finer details with squad leader Forn. Aton had a precise departure time, 8.23 a.m. sharp. Cal Katoon's dental appointment was slated for 8.30 a.m., with the next appointment set for 9 a.m. Aton's arrival was planned for 8.41 a.m. 
At 8.55 a.m., a drone following a pre-programmed route would swoop in and apply hull weld gel to the dental office door. The gel would fully dry in two minutes, effectively sealing the door after one minute. If Cal Katoon left his appointment early, the drone wouldn't have applied the gel, and he would likely exit through the front door of the dental office, and the operation would be scrapped. Eitan was secretly hoping for this outcome. Eitan exited his apartment, descending the external staircase leading to the sandy streets below. Despite the early hour, patrons were already drinking beer outside the bar across the street. Eitan met their gaze and nodded. His stomach twisted tighter with each passing second. He glanced at his comm unit. 8.22 a.m. One more minute. He waited, watching the clock. When it struck 8.23 a.m., he launched himself forward, the leg augmentation lending an airy lightness to his stride. He slowed himself, not wanting to arrive earlier than scheduled, slow and steady. The sky was, as usual, unblemished, barring a few wisps of clouds dotting the bright bluish canvas of Sanion's atmosphere, visible through the clear overhead dome that glistened in the sunlight. A few days under it, and you barely knew that it was there. The streets were alive, vendors hawking their wares, shops welcoming early morning customers, and Aton making his way to carry out his first assassination. The contrast was surreal. Aton wore glasses that projected the steps he needed to follow to evade surveillance cameras as best as possible. He moved briskly through the city streets, only diverging from the designated path ever so slightly to avoid pedestrians or the sporadic foot cart brushing past him. This was acceptable for the time being, when appearing on a camera or two wasn't detrimental. But as he neared his destination, he would have to adhere strictly to the outlined path, regardless of any obstacles. The room for error was exceedingly small. Upon reaching the six-block mark, in close proximity to Millie's position, Aitan ducked into a small parts supply store. It would be the final place he'd be caught on surveillance. He made a show of browsing for the stipulated one minute. He mentally counted down the seconds, and right on cue, his comm unit vibrated, signaling it was time. He placed the random part he'd picked up, something he surmised belonged to an old model of a land cruiser unfamiliar to him, back on the shelf and exited through the store's rear door, stepping into a narrow alleyway sandwiched between two buildings. Emerging from the alley, he made a sharp left onto Tilku Street, keeping to the left side of the thoroughfare as closely as possible without appearing odd just as his glasses instructed. Halfway down the street, he needed to cut across at a steep angle, not quite perpendicular, but close enough. There's a cart, Felsen's voice chimed in through Aton's earpiece. Sure enough, a large meat cart currently serving customers blocked his direct path. Can I go around it? Aton queried. Uh, damn, no. The path you need to tread is razor thin. A step on either side and you're in the camera's view. Felsen replied. Great, Aton muttered. Guess I'm going over. Why? Caro's voice broke in over the comms, but it was too late. Bounding onto the bench in front of the food cart, Aton leaped onto the top, then propelled himself over and onto the ground. His landing was more dramatic than intended, drawing audible gasps from the crowd. He quickly dusted himself off, threw a cheeky wink at an elderly woman staring at him in shock, and continued along his designated path. Ha! Huh? Millie's muffled, high-pitched exclamation rang out in his ear. Did you just cause a scene on your way to the mission? Caro's voice came through, clearly strained with irritation. I could have been more subtle about it. You think? Caro's yell caused Aton to wince from the volume in his ear. Look, I didn't think the jump would make such a spectacle. What were my other options? Hang around the cart and miss my window? Circumvent it and be spotted by cameras? Crawl underneath? There's no good choice. Perhaps not, but you still need to handle these situations better. We'll drop this issue for now, but rest assured we will revisit it once everyone is safely home, squad leader Caro Forn said. Yes, sir, Aton responded, a sudden pang of foolishness washing over him for his reckless action. He continued to follow the predefined path shown to him on the glasses. There were no more surprises and Aton, hugging the left side of the street, slipped his way down into the alleyway outside of the side exit of Wolan Dentistry. He didn't want to stand up and attract attention. Anyone would be able to see him in the alley and ID the six-foot-eight man as the new giant guy in town, 
so he hunched over and buried his nose in his comm unit. It was 8.37, five minutes before the hull weld gel was applied to the door. Then Cal would be out shortly after that. Chapter 9, Soli City, Planet Sanion, Tevsu System, Ballast Branch. Sitting comfortably in a time-worn chair, Raj presided over the bustling activities of his desert front shop from behind his weathered old-world desk. Its varnished wood reflected the tales of countless transactions, and the residue of relentless desert sand subtly outlined its edges. The ever-observant eyes of Raj took in the efficient movements of the young clerks, scuttling like trained ants, facilitating the exchange of a myriad of digital data to be sold on the network, or providing customers with the tangible copies of data they had purchased. His gaze wandered, escaping the confines of his shop, taking in the streets of Soli. A narrow, sandy artery lined with bustling commerce, across from his shop, a constellation of food vendors carved out their existence. There they were, peddling their edible offerings, aromatic soups that sent tendrils of steam into the dry air, fresh breads baked to a rustic gold, and exotic sweets from systems light years away, each promising a gustatory journey through the cosmos. An incessant lump formed in Raj's throat, stubbornly lodged there since the early hours of the day. The looming meeting with his boss, Aliano Mertz, the unfaltering consigliere of the Roosevelt clan, cast an ominous shadow over his mind. Holding the position of second in command, Mertz was a voice that echoed the commands of the big boss himself. Raj found himself trapped in this echo chamber, acquiescing to every word that fell from Mertz's lips. Anticipation caused his palms to sweat, each bead mirroring his apprehension. The cryptic nature of the impending meeting pricked his nerves, gnawing at his love for preparedness. A man of strategy, he abhorred the feeling of going in blind, the anxiety of the unknown. His fingers absentmindedly toyed with a miniature land cruiser on his desk, its sturdy build serving as a small distraction from his thoughts. In the labyrinth of his mind, he traversed countless scenarios, grappling with possibilities. Was this about finances? A cold dread seized him at the prospect of a misstep. It had been a considerable amount of time since he had bungled anything up, particularly since his ascension to the role of capo about two years ago. The Roosevelt clan, born out of a volatile concoction of necessity and chaos, replaced the previous regime, the Goa. The Goa was a vicious totalitarian regime, its iron fist ruling the system for over half a century. In the aftermath of its downfall, the Corps entrusted the reins to a true spectacle of ineptitude, Laro Pillman, as the system's president. Pillman proved to be a disaster of epic proportions. His reckless financial decisions led to crumbling supply chains and burgeoning debts. His pleas for help from the neighboring Ballas branch systems only added to the chaotic descent into financial ruin. Soon enough, his desperation pushed him towards the less savory paths for financial aid. This marked the initiation of President Laro Pillman's unholy alliance with the Roosevelt clan and the meteoric rise of Raj and his crew, who had been modest players in the game of mid-level schemes. They evolved into an unstoppable force, a juggernaut that was untouchable in the system. His thoughts were interrupted by a disgruntled customer at the front of his shop. The clerk, with a serene grace, effectively diffused the situation, navigating through the complaint with a blend of diplomacy and assertiveness. His shop was running like a well-oiled machine, mirroring the efficacy of their other, more shadowy business. It had been a while since Raj felt this surge of hope, the promise of a prosperous future inching closer within his peripherally. A faint flicker caught Raj's attention, the subtle blink of his comm unit. A new message had arrived, seeping into his oasis of tranquility like an unwelcome drop of oil. With a small frown creasing his forehead, he allowed the message to unfurl onto the screen. Cal Katoon is in the side alley adjacent to Wolin's Dental, harassing Rue. His eyes widened, his normally hardened gaze reflecting a flicker of disbelief. He devoured the words again, a feeling of incredulity washing over him. Was it possible? Was he reading this correctly? Twice more, he poured over the cryptic message, the foreign ID number that birthed it gnawing at his confusion. What was Rue doing there? She was supposed to be at home, getting ready for school. And Cal, that son of a fucking bitch. 
A disbelieving curse slipped under his breath, softly disturbing the charged silence of his own astonishment. He fired off a quick message to his wife, asking if Rue was with her, which he would expect. He sent a surreptitious glance around his shop, trying to gauge if his moment of shock had registered on the radar of his busy staff or intrigued customers. But they remained oblivious, engrossed in their friendly negotiations and haggling. The wheels of his mind spun furiously, sifting through a sandstorm of possibilities. The imminent meeting with the conciliere loomed in his mind. Was this cryptic message a preamble to the meeting they had mentioned? Could the source of this communication be the conciliere himself or the boss? Was this a practical joke, a trap laid by someone with a malicious sense of humor? A ghost of a bitter memory then resurrected itself, his ongoing feud with Cal Catoon. Their notorious bar brawl from the year prior was still fresh. The exchange of veiled threats a recurring echo. He hadn't envisaged their petty rivalry escalating beyond that. Could it have spiraled out of control? Would he really bring families into this? A moment's contemplation led him to a dead end. The sender's identity was a mystery that would remain so, as he would not dare to respond to the cryptic message. His intuition hinted at a trap, the likelihood looming large and discomforting. But at his core, Raj was a loyal soldier, a dutiful henchman. His rise through the ranks in the Roosevelt's organization had been paved by his steadfast obedience. A sudden detour now was unthinkable. He pushed himself out of his chair, its creaking protest echoing in the silent space around him. He strode towards his desk drawer, revealing the familiar gleam of his trusty revolver. He checked its chambers, ensuring it was primed for a possible confrontation. The weight of the gun, securely tucked at the small of his back, was a comforting reminder of his preparedness. With a final glance cast over his shoulder, he departed from his sanctuary of the shop. The tantalizing aroma of the food cart served as a tempting lure, guiding him towards his uncertain encounter. Chapter 10. Soli City, Planet Sanian. Tevsu System, Ballas Branch. Atan perched himself awkwardly against the rust-bitten wall of the unassuming structure that played host to Walton Dental, among other medical institutions. Its rough exterior bore the permanent stain of the pervasive Soli dust, betraying no hint of the polished cleanliness that was maintained within its belly. The omnipresent dust and sand from the desolate expanse of Saneon always found its way into the buildings, piggybacking on the footwear of the customers. It was a nuisance synonymous with conducting business on the planet's surface. Only those who could afford the luxury of space leases on stations could hope to escape the onslaught of grime. Nervous habits consumed him as he chewed on his nails and the raw skin at the edge of his fingertips, a macabre testament to his anxiety. The gnawing dread of anticipation was the worst. He found a cold comfort in spontaneity over foreknowledge. Drone inbound, came the stern warning from Felsen over the comms channel. Eitan piped the live feed from his comm unit into a miniature display on his smart glasses. The drone, barely visible, hovered near the summit of the city's dome, a remote sentinel in the sky. Without warning, the drone initiated its descent, obliterating the distance in a rapid plunge. The city's drone-filled skyline transformed before Eitan's eyes, morphing from a modest desert town into a bustling backwater metropolis within the blink of an eye. The drone zeroed in above a familiar structure situated directly across from Wolan's dental. It juked agilely to align itself with the front entrance, unleashing a quick burst of hull seal gel before shooting back towards the sanctuary of the dome's pinnacle. Verification of the accuracy of its shot was impossible. Assumption was their only ally. As long as Cal Catoon's appointment didn't end prematurely, he would emerge from the side door any moment now. Aton, his palms moist with nervous perspiration, drew his trench coat over his knees in a futile attempt to blend into his surroundings. He felt absurdly conspicuous. Agent Finley, squad leader Forn's voice came through. Be ready. Acknowledging the command with a nod, Eitan was acutely aware of the watchful eyes monitoring the video feed from his glasses. Then, the sound that he'd been waiting for pierced his heightened senses. The groaning protest of the door. His grip tightened around the revolver, its chamber loaded with explosive rounds nestled in the holster at his hip. He remained hunched, concealed. 
The door creaked open, revealing the cropped-haired figure in the signature Black Scales jacket, Cal Katoon. Caught off guard by Atan's sudden movement, Cal's gaze shot towards him as he straightened up, the revolver in his hand pointing unerringly at Cal's face. Cal froze, his wide eyes mirroring surprise and fear. Every muscle in his body braced for action. Aton recognized the volatile tension in Cal's body language. It reminded him of a cornered beast ready to attack. Hoping to create a safe buffer, Aton took a step back. Cal, however, lunged forward. Caught off balance, Aton stumbled backward, his grip on the revolver faltering. The deafening sound of an explosion filled the air as he inadvertently pulled the trigger, the explosive round finding an unknown target. Cal froze, as if turned to stone, his mouth agape in stunned silence. Aton mirrored him, their expressions reflecting identical shock. As they both looked down, a gaping, gruesome cavity in Cal's torso became apparent. Aton took in the sight of exposed ribs, the mangled mess of lung tissue, and a glimpse of what he suspected was a significantly damaged heart. With a trembling hand, Cal reached for the destroyed region where his chest used to be. His fingers were instantly soaked with a flood of crimson as he collapsed, lungs too compromised to draw in any semblance of a breath. Frozen in his spot, Aton gawked at Cal Katoon's futile struggle on the ground. Cal's attempted scream devolved into a pitiful gurgle. Get out now, squad leader Forn commanded through the comms, snapping Aton back to the brutal reality. The sight of the pooling blood was a stark reminder of the deadly outcome. Get out now! Aton's gaze darted down the lengths of the alley, noting the growing number of curious onlookers drawn towards the site of the incident. His attention returned to the wall separating the alley and the building next door, about 15 feet up, promising a potential escape route. Aton's mind was a whirlwind, but he had faith in his leg augmentations to guide him to safety. Chapter 11, Soli City, Planet Sanion, Tevsu System, Ballas Branch. The explosion reverberated through the air, reaching Raj's ears when he was no more than a block away from the alley where Cal Katoon and Rue were allegedly located, his mind racing. He had been jogging, but the ominous sound amplified his urgency, spurring him into a full-on sprint towards the sound. Echoing screams and the ensuing commotion amplified his anxiety. Arriving at the scene, he skidded around the corner, his momentum carrying him to a shocked halt. There was no sign of Rue. On the ground lay a man in the recognizable black scales jacket, unmistakably Cal Katoon. A significant pool of blood was quickly expanding around him. Peripheral movement caught his attention, a shadowy figure soaring over the nearby wall. His gaze trailed upwards, but all he caught was the fleeting glimpse of a billowing coat disappearing over the building's crest. For a fleeting moment, he considered pursuing the mysterious figure but the lifeless gaze from Cal Katoon held him in a chilling trance. The sight of him clutching at an empty chest cavity was nauseatingly familiar to Raj, the unmistakable aftermath of an explosive round. Where is Rue? he asked, and Cal responded with a confused look, all that he could muster with his dying breaths. Raj waited for an answer, but none came. He shuddered and lay still, the life seeping out of him on the sand streets of Sully. At that moment, his wife answered his text from earlier. He glanced at his comm unit. Rue was home, getting ready to leave. At that moment, Raj was just as confused as Cal had been. Kneeling beside the dying man, he gently closed Cal's eyes with a solemn sweep of his hand. Despite his disdain for Cal Katoon, Raj believed that even the most unlikable of people deserved a basic level of dignity.